Hello, and welcome to another wonderful video of ICMI 21. As always, I'm joined with Vernon. And today we have Carnell Smith. It is a great honor to have Carnell Smith. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing well, Chris and Vernon. How are you guys? Hey, it's uh, 2021. It's time to talk about ICMI. Indeed. I'm doing quite well myself. So for those who may not know, in case you've been living under a rock, Carnell Smith is a man that has changed the world. Like so many men went through the ringer when it came to a paternity fraud issue. Now, a lot of men, understandably, when they go through this, they just, you know, try to deal with the system. But Carnell said, no system needs to change and he dedicated himself to changing the system and even going all the way to the supreme court of the united states i mean they get choosy on the cases they do and he was there so this is why it's such an honor to be with someone who is such an advocate for paternity fraud so my first question to you is before all of this happened who were you and what were your thoughts on things like men's rights? Okay. All right. That's a great question, Chris. Before my discovery of being a victim of paternity fraud, like so many men and boys worldwide, I thought I was a father of two. I thought I was a dad of a son who I'd been separated with from by family court through parental alienation. And then the mother moved to an adjacent state. And I thought that relationship was over. And I thought I had a daughter with a former girlfriend because she said these seven words that no man wants to hear from an ex-wife, ex-girlfriend, or ex-fiance. I'm pregnant and you are the father. And when I heard that news, I said, like, well, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm going to take care of my child, but if you think that's going to get us back into another relationship, no. And that led to me discovering after 11 years later, it was all based on a lie. And if you want me to elaborate, the, the lie was this very simply this, that she'd been involved with at least one other guy during her window of conception for the child and knowingly and willingly did not disclose that information to me. So let's think about this. So the rationale would be this. Why would a woman not disclose to a guy that there's one, two, three, or more possible candidates that could be the father of a child. And over my years of doing this as an advocate, as a legislative consultant, providing DNA services across the nation, and, and in some cases involving men who were deployed around the world, I've come to discover a couple of common factors. And number one is, it's the guy who she wants it to be that she'll claim is the father, the guy who makes the most money, so therefore he is a better candidate to get the maximum financial reward through family court, or for this touchy-feely reason, this the guy she's in love with, regardless of what he wants, regardless of what he thinks. And that, in my opinion, reveals a major flaw in the court system for family court specifically, where truth is not regarded as the absolute standard. And it should be, and it could be. So to the public, the prevalence of paternity fraud seems kind of way out there. It's like almost unbelievable. How do you explain to them that this is the sort of thing that's actually happening? Well, first I would say over the years, the pushback that I get over my advocacy for paternity fraud victims is this is not really a major problem, is what I've heard in the United States and in several countries where I've been able to connect with men who are victims who want to advocate for legislative reform. And those people constantly say to me, it's a minor problem. It's really not that big a deal. We shouldn't do anything about it. We should look the other way. You saw that? look the other way, as if that somehow changes a lie into the truth. And here's what we found out. Over a 10-year period in the United States of over 
we found that over a million men and boys who have been tested, they were proven to not be the fathers of the children. Over one million proven by DNA testing that they are not the fathers of the children in spite of what the mother said, who might be a wife, a fiance, a girlfriend, regardless of what her social status is in the relationship, somehow she chose to not reveal all the facts to the guy who she either wanted it to be, or look, she has some other motivation, like could be financial reasons. Not too many married women will disclose to their husband that, oh, by the way, your brother, your cousin, and most of the marital party, you know, the, the best man and his friends, all of them could be the father. She is usually not going to disclose that information to her brand new husband. And therein lies the problem. So when those people try to tell me it's not a big deal and it's a minor problem, I say, well, let's look at the data. Look at the fact that over the roughly 30% of those men and boys who get tested, according to the American Association of Blood Banks, they have a annual family study, parentage study. It used to be called an annual paternity study. And for some reason, they changed the name. Hmm. I'd like to know why make it harder when the majority of the types of, of relationship testing that goes on, a majority of that testing is paternity testing, trying to determine what man is related to a child, a, teen, uh, a teenager, a toddler, and in some cases, adults. Now, going around the nation, going around the world, so to speak, it has gotten so bad that a country like France has passed a law saying that the man can't even get a paternity test unless the mother gives her consent and permission. And that is absurd and illogical. Like the very person who has the incentive to lie, cheat, and steal, why would we ask her, well, by the way, were you involved with anyone else during the window of conception? And if so, have you disclosed by a sworn affidavit to each of those men that you are one of the paternity candidates as opposed to, I believe in my heart you are the father? This, this attitude that is not really a big deal, let's expand on it a little further. The geneticists and, and other academic studies have been done so far that have gone so far to say that roughly five to 15% of the families worldwide are impacted. Now, in Carnell's mind as an engineer, as a data guy, seems to me we should be doing more DNA testing. And that's why I came out and said, you know what? Let's save the mother some shame and embarrassment. Let's not even ask her for who she believes is the father. Let's just do automatic DNA testing at birth so that the child can get reliable information on their birth certificate from day one. And I'm narrowing it down so that we don't have to have touchy feely standards, you know, called subjective truth. I am a big advocate of tossing that out the window and let's come up with objective truth. Either that man or boy caused the pregnancy or he didn't. And DNA is either going to confirm it or refute it. And the radical groups, uh, especially feminists, have come out and said, that's not fair. You should not be able to let that guy off the hook because he was there first. I'm like, wait a minute. He wouldn't have been in that position. And from the men that I've talked to over 20 years, they said, I would have never been in that position had I known there was four other guys that could be the dad. I would have canceled the wedding. I would have canceled the engagement. And I said, everything else is on hold till we find out, is this baby mine? You're talking about the work that you've done and that you found over a million fathers and sons not related to each other, about 30% of all the cases you've gotten. And you've mentioned the law in France. Now, what I'm curious about is how does America compare with the rest of the world when it comes to paternity fraud? In your opinion, is it worse here or is it worse somewhere else? In my opinion, it is worse in the United States 
because the standard for determining what to do about it when you find out that the definition of paternity for the child has been based on a lie. And instead of it being based on objective truth has been based on subjective truth by asking the mother instead of, no, your honor, what were the test results? We believe in science when there's an allegation that some guy committed some type of sexual crime against a woman. And if the DNA of the perpetrator matches the guy that they got, he faces criminal charges and, and in many cases will be convicted, not based on feelings, not based on subjective truth, but based on the evidence that lines up with objective facts. And I'm just, I'm called radical because I said the same standard can be applied in family courts and the judges shouldn't be allowed to order any transferal of property, money, assess any type of money fees and damages, et cetera, until that first question gets answered. See, I like to simplify things. Men and boys can be the father of a child, but we shouldn't be asking women and girls whether or not that's the father. Too many incentives and reasons for her to play footloose with the truth, to knowingly and willingly conceal material facts. And in the United States, whether or not you can become a paternity fraud victim varies based on your marital status, varies based on what state you're in, what jurisdiction you're under. And just to like quickly hit it, there are four five primary ways I found that men and boys become paternity fraud victims. And number one, the man or boy signs a document where he admits to paternity before he has any objective truth that he did it. And it's called voluntary acknowledgement, or as Carnell likes to call it, a confession of paternity without proof. Number two, incorrect default judgment. In the United States and in, in, in any state that has adopted the same model, the way that family court works in the U.S., a court can issue a lawsuit against a man or boy and not even be sure that they have served him at the correct address because guess who they got their information from that claims this is where he should be served? from the child's mother. And if she gives her address instead of his real physical address, this guy will not know about the court hearing. And because he doesn't show up at the court hearing, a family court judge or hearing officer can make him be the father by default because he did not show up to defend himself. And in California, they were so good at executing default judgments, at one time, we, we, we saw the results of a study that said 80% of all of the child support orders established in California over that period were done by default judgment. And I found over 600 military men in various branches of the armed forces, married, single. When you are deployed out of the country, in wartime or in peacetime and you have a, have a duty station where you're not in the U.S., you don't exactly get to come back and say, hey, I'm going to be in court next week, um, platoon leader. I need you to make arrangements for me to get to court. Well, these guys generally don't find out about the lawsuit until their paycheck starts getting deducted. So that's number two. Number three, the marital presumption of paternity, which means any children the wife has while she's married to her husband are automatically presumed to be her husband's children. Now, based on the, the fact that over 80% of divorces are filed by women and there's no fault divorce, and we're finding, at least on my uh, paternity coach channel on YouTube, majority of the paternity fraud victims are married men. Well, so what does this say? There are a lot of married women who cheat on their husbands. So a law that's based on the old English common law back, you know, 15th, 16th century that said that, yes, because there was no way the guy could really prove he wasn't the father. So unless he was away on the high seas for over a nine month period where he didn't have access to the wife 
or his equipment didn't work. I'll say it again. If his equipment didn't work, then he could not cause the pregnancy. And therefore, he would have had a legally justifiable alibi to say, that is not my baby. But in the states in the United States that have adopted that old English common law, in the face of a DNA test and the mother's statement says, oh, I want my boyfriend's name to be on the child's birth certificate. All of the states that hold to the common law that says the married husband is automatically the father. And in spite of objective truth, scientific evidence, those states refuse to overturn it and assign the responsibility to the two people who had the most fun in creating that child the wife and her boyfriend. And number four, the, the last one that I've seen happen with quite a bit of frequency is mistaken identity. Men who have similar names can be tagged as the father of a kid they don't know for a woman they didn't touch, don't even know. And there is a program in the United States that is used to hunt down people who are deemed to be evading service, and it's called the Data Match Program. And this is one of the reform areas during the 1996 to 98 Title IV D section, Personal Work and Responsibility Act, signed into law by President William Jefferson Clinton. And all of this was supposed to be massive welfare reforms to make men be responsible. Notice I put emphasis on that, to make men be responsible. Now, how do we make men responsible for a pregnancy that he didn't commit? <laughs> and teen boys make them responsible for a pregnancy that he didn't commit. And the only thing he's guilty of, he believed the mother when she said, I'm pregnant and that's your baby. In Carnell's world, we won't ask her anymore. We'll just do DNA testing at birth and we'll get objective truth. So how are the children in question, you know, the children that are the product of these paternities, the frauds, uh, how are they affected by the revelation of this when it happens? That is a great question, Vernon. So you're asking me, how are the children affected by paternity fraud when it's revealed to them? Good question. So here, it, here's what happens in, in many, if not most cases, is that the child's mother cuts off contact with the guy who thought he was the dad. Some of those guys would be willing to continue to have a relationship with the child just based on longevity, based on having had a relationship with the child, and a desire to be an active partner, parent, if you would. Uh, many of them are no longer willing to be under a court order that says you pay this exorbitant amount or you go to jail or prison. Many of them say, well, if I'm able to see the child, I will be willing to do things directly for the child that I spend on as long as I'm provided to continue to have a relationship. So invariably, these children end up getting angry with the guy for getting paternity testing done because guess who told him this is his fault? The child's mother. So as a deflection, and instead of being an accountable, personally accountable for her own action, because albeit without the lie that she told, and the lie did, listen, let's be honest, the lie doesn't surface just because the testing was done and the guy finds out the lie happened at the time she knew she had intimate relations with one or more other people. And then she knowingly and willingly concealed it from the guy who she wanted to be the father, or she kept her fingers crossed behind her back and said, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping. And then they'll go so far as to wait till the baby's born to try to figure out who the baby looks like. And if the baby looks close enough, like that guy, they will try to actively persuade him to go ahead and sign the legal documentation. And thereby he gets trapped by the law. The other thing that happens with these children, sometimes they are so frustrated, angry, upset 
that in my opinion, we should, there should be a mechanism to provide them with counseling and therapy and left up to me. I've told the men, they should never be the one to tell the child the truth. That should come out in a controlled environment and a therapy session, but they should be told just like children who are adopted, they get to know that my medical history and my, my adopted parents' medical history will not match. There are many medical, social reasons, and they're being denied the truth about their genetic ancestral heritage. And, you know, just to piggyback on the medical thing, what if your actual biological father has a condition that is such that it is going to kill him by age 40, but if you know about it in advance and can take preemptive medical processes, procedures and steps and, and, and whatever, to, because you become aware of the medical history of the family, then you could increase the survivability of the child. I mean, there are many things like multiple sclerosis and a whole bunch of other things that men didn't find out that the child wasn't his, not because he was looking for a DNA test, but because the child came down with a genetic disease that could only be carried by the biological mother and the biological father. So if two parents are carried a trait, the probability of the child developing the disease goes way up. But yet there are still those people who say we should look the other way and pretend this doesn't exist. And the guy that believed he was the dad, we should keep him under that order because he didn't figure it out in time. And Carnell Smith says that's an injustice against him. That's an injustice against the kid. And why should he pay if you're not even going to even let him have a relationship with the kid? So what would he be paying for? And I've asked this question that no one has been willing to answer. What did the guy do wrong? My profound logic says if he's guilty of anything, he was guilty of believing in a person who was unfit to be believed in. Your experience within the court system and all the research you've done why do you feel that the courts and judges are so against DNA testing? Why are they so against trying to find out who the actual father is? Instead, they say, okay, well, he's here right now, so he's the father, he has to suffer. Why does this court have this bias? Well, it's not entirely the court. It really depends on where the guy is in the process. Now, direct to your question, my experience with courts and judges tend to show a bias on overturning an existing court order based on the fact that guy is not the father. And then they say, well, why didn't he do something sooner? Like, wait a minute. The mother just told a guy last week that the kid is not his and that she's about to marry the biological father. And she wants him to get out of her face and just make sure he keeps the check coming. And for a lot of men, that statement would be a bit hard for him to accept and still remain under pay or go to jail. Now, there are cases in the United States where the judge was amenable to overturning and vacating the order. But the Office of Child Support Enforcement, which is funded by the Title 4D Section 458 in the United States that provides a funding mechanism to provide funds for each state to run their child support enforcement money-making machine. And that, that last part's from me. I call it a money-making machine because that, that agency has a tendency to be found under the structure of the state's Department of Revenue. What? Think about that. A taxpayer-funded office is listed under the state's Department of Revenue and the district attorney up to the office of the attorney general in that state and the various attorneys who are used to enforce the orders, my experience is they will use every legal precedent and every bit of case law based on the history that they rarely will go along and agree to let this man or boy go who had been duped, deceived, fooled, taken advantage of 
But yet when I've asked many of those in judiciary committees, I say, well, if that's your position, why don't you say that right up front? that any man who believes the mother is a fool and that you will prosecute him for nothing more than believing her when she should have the legal, ethical, moral duty to disclose those material facts. Because just telling the guy that there's five other people or one other person could be the child's father is enough of a notice to where men and boys I've talked to for over 20 years says, there's no way I would have signed a paternity confession if that had been disclosed to me up front. No way would I have married her. And this is a thing of being genteel, chivalrous. A lot of guys will marry the mother based on her saying, I'm pregnant and you're the father, so that he could make the environment be legitimate for the child and that the child could then be covered under his insurance, under his benefits, and all of these things are being done based on the foundation of a lie. Those men have said to me, there's no way I would have married her. I would not have given her a ring out of a Cracker Jack box with that information being revealed up front. So when I ask these questions before the various legislative bodies, I'll say, so why be so adamantly opposed to vacating the order when the only reason we're here asking for legislative reform so that judges cannot ignore the truth and we cannot have the child support enforcement agency advocating for its own interests instead of the truth that's in the case, we should be basing these cases based on objective truth. He caused that pregnancy or he did not. He's the adopted parent or he's the biological parent of this child. That doesn't leave any wiggle room for uh, slickery, trickery, you know, sleight of hand. Look, I got the truth hidden under my hand here, but since you didn't know it was there, it's your fault you didn't ask. That is insane. And people with common sense agree with me. Now, I'm realistic. We can't prevent women and girls from lying and be 100% certain that they'll never lie again about how many people, who were you involved with during the window of conception with the child, rather than you just going by who you believe is the father. How about let's ask this question. During the 30 day window of the child's conception date, 30 days before and 30 days after, did you have intimate sexual relations with anybody during that window? Who are they? And then make her provide a paternity notification affidavit to each one of them that they could be the father. So now each guy knows there are seven other guys that could be the father or one other guy or 22 other guys that could be the father. And because they'll have that information in the form of affidavit, guess who would be less inclined to sign a paternity confession saying I did it when you just gave me an affidavit showing there's 25 other people did it. <laughs> Look, might have done it. That's why right now I'm, a, I'm participating in creating a, a national academic study. And we have a survey up available right now. We want men and boys who've been affected to fill out and they can do so anonymously, but they're getting to tell their story and I have a sociology professor who is going to complete that study and publish it so that we can take this issue more mainstream rather than it be more of a sideline conversation. Now, when Carnell Smith said, well, gee, the way to, to mitigate this is do DNA testing up front. Don't even ask the mother who has just delivered that baby. Don't you worry her at all. Just go ahead and have the nurse come in and, and use the buckle swabs and swab her mouth and get her sample of her, her DNA. And you can swab the baby within minutes of the baby being born. I've done newborns. I did say I've been a 10-year provider of legal DNA services. So yes, you can do it on the day the baby's born. Then you get a sample from the alleged father. I didn't say presumed father big difference. 
And in less than a week, something happens. The truth comes back. And just like with one of my clients who, who secured my services, the man said he needed to be sure that his wife's baby was his. And he wanted to know, could I provide him with mobile legal services so that he would get full chain of custody and provide him with test results that would be legally admissible in court? I said, sir, you've come to the right place. I had a truth mobile back then, a limousine tinted van, and you could actually get your testing, your sampling done in the van. But since the baby and the mother were up in the, you know, newborn ward, we had to get approval and everything and go right up there and make sure we did what the client contracted. And less than a week later, the truth came back. The truth came back and it revealed that he was not the father of his wife's baby. And that explained why we had received a phone call from his wife before the results got back. She offered us $10,000 to make sure that the test results came back and said that her husband was the father. I said, lady, you're out your mind. This is one test. I'm not going to damage my reputation. I have integrity and honor. And, and if I did this, I would lose all credibility as a legislative advocate, as a DNA service provider. I was providing services at courts as well as in hospitals. There's no way. I was like, lady, you can't pay me enough money to make sure your husband turns out to be the dad. And, and, and had looking a little more at this information, I say, so now I see it's not just single men, it's not just unmarried boys who are paternity for all victims. There are a ton of financial incentives for married women to do this to her husband. And that's not right. So it's my understanding that you actually changed a law in Georgia, right? And also 10 other states, is that correct? Yeah, Vernon, that is correct. Um, after, um, after my five-year battle from the time I first got served on my own case to finally uh, taking it to the U.S. Supreme Court, and who, by the way, after we had two meetings with the U.S. Supreme Court, they declined. They turned me down. After we showed them there's over a million guys and boys that we know about, my whole intent in taking that case to the U.S. Supreme Court was to mitigate the need to lobby state by state in U.S. country, I mean, U.S. states and territories to get a law to limit the discretions of the judge so that the judges could not exclude the truth of a DNA test. And the judges should not be allowed to prevent the man or boy from getting a DNA test when he has said, wait a minute, hold on, some facts have come up, some, something has come up now to where I need to examine whether or not I'm actually related to the child. So while I was lobbying for, I'm sorry, let me restate that, while I had my own case going through appeal, each court, starting with the first court, the first court said it was my fault that I didn't find out that she had lied to me for 11 years. And I asked this question, well, how was I supposed to do that? I'm guilty of believing a woman who I'd been in a relationship with for over two and a half years. After I broke up with her, she contacts me several months later saying that she was pregnant. And she told me a date that lined up with when I had been involved with her. The truth of the matter was she actually got pregnant six weeks after I broke up her, with her with the other guy. She never told that part until after I found out by DNA testing that, that I was not related to her child. So I lobbied parallel, kept my case going before all of the courts, while I also did the appeals through state appellate, um, up to the U.S. Supreme Court. I also met one of my state uh, representatives and I pointed out to him how easy this was to make him or his son a paternity fraud victim, and that this problem had been solved in another state, specifically in Ohio back in 2000, and that with legislation, you could take out the judge's ability to ignore the truth. When it comes to what the truth is, 
uh, it seemed disingenuous that a judge is actually called a trier of fact. But when it comes to paternity fraud, judges were going out of their way to ignore the facts. And the prosecutor side that is trying to enforce the existing order represented by the Office of Child Support Enforcement were doing everything in their power to keep the guy that they got in their hand versus go look for the guy that she may have to tell them about. So during this lobbying, uh, we did get legislation introduced and it was the House Bill 369 and it ended up getting um, signed into law. And after it was signed into law on May the 9th of 2002, I went back to court after the Supreme Court turned me down. And I remember something that I wrote into that law. So I'm like, well, gee, since I did write that, then, then it now applies to me because I never lobbied for that law for myself. I was trying to make sure nobody else had to put up 25 grand to hire an attorney to get started on the battle like I did. For me, this is something that once the truth is out, that judge should have been able to make a ruling in 30 minutes and we should have been in and out and we should have been talking about the payment plan on how this woman's gonna pay me back and either she could do it by herself or her and the biological father together can do it. Don't matter to me, return everything. That was my position. And I wanted that position for every man or boy who had been deceived and financially robbed uh, over the barrel like that. I went back to court on February 6, 2003, using the law that I, that I helped to co-write with my state senate and my state representative, and I won. I wiped out all of the arrears. I wiped out all of the future payments. I wiped out all of the impact that it could cause my credit. And I got my name removed off of every legal document as the father. And I demanded that they reissue the birth certificate and provide me with a certified copy with my name removed. And I got all of that. The one thing I didn't get, I didn't get my money back. <laughs> so I'm out of over a quarter of a million dollars of my own money. And I felt that was unjust and unfair, but I've helped a lot of my clients be able to recover that money because I learned some things about what we didn't do in my case. Now, in what should happen, if there is equal accountability and there's equal responsibility, the woman who lies and profits or girl who profits from lying in order to receive money and then is found later to be guilty of lying, you shouldn't be allowed to keep what you got. That should be considered ill-gotten gains. Look, just because you don't catch the bank robber until two years later, do you tell him, well, gee, you got away with it long enough? <laughs> My bad, I didn't catch you in time. But when it comes to paternity fraud, you could literally have a judge tell you in court, well, it's your fault you didn't find out sooner when you had no reason to know that the other side was lying. Because when you're dealing with intimate partner relations, and in this case, a two and a half year relationship, I never knew the woman to lie about anything. I was guilty of trusting her. Well, gee, how many guys have done that? Trusted the woman they were in a relationship with. Hey, that, that should not be a reason that we punish men and boys and make them face jail and prison. In Cardinal Smith's world, which sounds like a wonderful place to live, should women be punished legally for lying about who the father is? That's a, that is a phenomenal question, Chris. So, so should women be punished for lying? I, when you say punished, I'm going to say it a different way. There should be consequences, and she should be held personally responsible for lies of omission and for lies of commission related to falsely uh, indicting the wrong man or boy as the father of a child. She should have the primary duty of as an ethical, legal, moral, and social duty to disclose that there's more than one person that could be the child's father. And if that guy has incurred damages, financial, as well as I say, he should be able to sue her for emotional distress actual financial damages, 
punitive damages for loss of use of his money, legal fees, and et cetera, because if there is a consequence for the actions, it will demonstrate to others that you can't get away with it, that there will be consequences, and you will not be rewarded. You will be held accountable. Look, there's a reason that bank robbers rob a bank. They rob the bank because they know that's where the money is. So why do women and girls continue to commit paternity fraud worldwide? Because they have few to no consequences. That should be changed. Because in this era where we hear the statements about, we want equal rights, I'm in agreement with them. We demand to have everything that the patriarchy has. I'm like, okay, fine. But that must include equal rights, must include equal accountability and equal responsibility. That means when you lie, you are responsible for your actions and there'll be consequences to go with it. If we as men are expected to make a full financial disclosure about our resources so while you are determining what type of financial support we are responsible for after you prove the child is ours, then you should have also the equal responsibility to make all of the relevant material facts known in the beginning. You, do, you, shouldn't, get the, you shouldn't get the hide behind P privilege. And, and you know what I mean by that. Or V privilege. You shouldn't be allowed to use your XX chromosome as a shield to protect you from having to disclose the truth and protect you from the consequences of your own actions. You say you want equal rights. All of the feminists should be on my side saying, yep, yep, all right, you're right, you're right. We want equal rights, then we must have the total package. The total package is equal rights, equal responsibility, equal accountability. Okay, so that's going to conclude our video today. I say this to so many of our guests, but I feel like I could talk to you for hours. You are a great speaker. You are very knowledgeable. And I definitely encourage people to seek you out. Um, I've got your book right here. One of the few books I've actually read. I do intend to read all of these books, but this oh, one sorry. I have read and I did like it. Well, so thank you, sir. Find this book, people. What are some other ways that people can uh, reach out to you or see some of your resources? Well, I'll tell you what, uh, I've, I've simplified the right way to get in touch with me. ThePaternityCoach.com. T-H-E, PaternityCoach.com. That one link gets you to my Amazon link to where you can get access to Trap by Law, an ebook or paperback. Gets you to my website for my personal Carnell Smith site. It gets you to the national survey for 2021, where we want paternity fraud victims to talk about it, to tell it, man, don't let this issue die in you to where you never got a chance to tell about what happened, what went wrong, and help us bring about change. Because you need to do it, and you do it in a way where we can help, maybe we can save some other men and boys from what you and I have endured. And it also provides you with my social media links to Facebook, Twitter, Facebook, and to my YouTube channel, well, you can see that um, I was actually on the Dr. Phil show with one of my married clients who was a doctor on staff at two hospitals, and his wife had an affair with a man of a different race. She tried to justify why my client should still be ordered to pay her $3,000 a month instead of the guy she worked with who made significantly less money than my client, the doctor. So to reach Carnell Smith, I'm the, I'm the paternity coach. I'm an advocate, consultant. Um, I actually help people who want to take the steps on, on reforming the law because sometimes the law is wrong. That's what my, very, my, my second attorney told me. He says, sometimes the law is wrong. The facts of your case are right. The evidence is right. Judge ruled against you because it's been historical for them to just overturn it. So what I, what I offer as a service provider is a wealth of knowledge of, from providing legal DNA service, from having written actual law, from actually helping get law implemented and passed 
in multiple states, I think that brings a value proposition and providing also have provided legal services to clients and to their attorneys to prepare for the three stages of their cases. So Carnell Smith, thepaternitycoach.com, thepaternitycoach.com. Thank you. And that does it for us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.